And thank you everybody for joining us. I'm Eric Booth and I'll be co-leading this session with Jose Angel, my colleague, and we'll introduce ourselves briefly in a couple of minutes. But to give you a little heads up for what's gonna happen in this action-packed 75 minutes, we're going to introduce the idea of action research as a working tool for teaching artists. Uh, in this session, we're going to start with a little poll that will give us a sense of where your uh, understanding of action research is. We're then going to move into a little warm-up activity, a little why, what, and how of action research. Uh, we'll introduce the way AIM, the Academy for Impact Through Music, uh, the, that's the main body of work we'll be sharing with you today, how it's used in, that, in our work with AIM. We'll give you a very specific example, and then we turn it over to you to give you an opportunity to quick sketch out what an action research experiment in your own work might look like. So you actually think through the structure of action research, apply it to your own work to see how that feels. We'll exchange a little bit about it, and then there'll be an invitation for you to join an ITAC working group to develop a user-friendly tool for the whole worldwide field. If this work as you're doing it today is interesting to you, you might wanna consider this working group that Jose Angel will lead. It's gonna be kind of light, light touch, it won't be super heavy, but the result is we actually create a user, a teaching artist friendly tool for the field around the world to make use of. All right, that's what we're gonna do. I'm Eric Booth, the oldest living teaching artist. I came across action research when I was working in a, a project with Harvard Project Zero almost 30 years ago. And I used it in several different occasions, particularly in the Empire State Partnerships, uh, which was at the time the largest teaching artist experiment in the US. And we made it a fundamental construct of that work. And then more recently in the Academy for Impact Through Music, and there they are coming up in the chat, uh, we use teaching artistry as a core professional development tool. And let me introduce my colleague, Jose Angel, and he is in the trenches actually using action research. A quick intro, Jose. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Eric. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, just picking up on what Madeline said before, uh, English is not my first language as well. So if there are any mistakes, please bear with me. I apologize in advance, but I will do my best. Um, I have the fortune to work as artistic director for El Sistema Greece. It's an El Sistema inspired program where we give access to music education uh, to every young people basically in Greece. Uh, I am a conductor and a teaching artist, and I have been uh, using action research since we came across with AIM, with the Academy of Impact Through Music. So I've been leading action research in our project, and I have been um, overseeing some marvelous results. Super. Let's find out where our participants are at. Madeline, let's go to our first poll to get a sense of your relationship to action research. Oh, uh, we got we got a we got two superstars here. And the rest, we've got a fifth that are new to it. We've got a, a pretty wide distribution across those who know a little about it and those who know a lot about it. Uh over over a third, about a third of our participants have actually been involved in action research. Uh, cool. That's really good for us to know. Let's take on that second poll. Okay. Our results are almost in there. And we have a clear majority in, that brought you to this event. I would have been surprised if nobody hit that number, hit that uh, answer. Uh that in fact, there's curiosity here. There's a sense that it's possibly useful and want to learn more about it. It's almost 60%. Beautiful. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to start you off with a warm up activity, and it's going to end up in a really fast breakout group 
to share your findings. Madeline's going to manage this. So here's the challenge for everybody. It will help if you have a, a piece of paper or are going to write something down. Would you get in mind a time in your life when you learned something over time because you were interested in it? A time when you learned something out of intrinsic motivation and it took a time. It could be in your art form or outside your art form. Get one learning journey in mind. And see if you can think of it as comprised of experiments, like things you were trying, parts of it that broke down to, I want to figure out how to do this better now. Like if you were bread baking, one experiment might be about getting the right crust. Or if it were about painting seascapes, it might be about how do you get moonlight on water? So can you identify one part of this longer learning journey? Think of it in your mind as an experiment. And can you start to organize it as an experiment? You know, um, what did you try? How did the trying go? Uh, what did it lead to? How did you know it was successful? What actually happened in the experiment? And what did it lead to? So what we're doing is taking natural learning journeys and viewing them through the lens of an action research experiment, one part of it. And I'll give you just another 30 seconds to pull together some thoughts. And then Madeline's going to zap you out into a breakout group to share your ideas in a quick three minutes. So it's a really short breakout to just share your ideas and practice thinking like an action researcher. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you didn't get whiplash from the world's fastest breakout session. Remember, it was just a warm up, completely unsatisfying, but a way to just get a feel for what we're moving into. Action research is really a slight formalization of the natural way people go about learning things. It really just pulls a few pieces in place to allow you to guide that learning in a more reliable way. Uh, and here's a bit about the what, the why, and the how of action research. It is a legitimate, uh, respected methodology in academic and professional research. It began being used in the U.S. around the 1930s. It's, it is widespread, mostly in education, but there's not a major university in the world that does not have action research experiments happening all the way. We It does appear in teaching artists work and in arts education research, uh, and we're now trying to pull it into teaching artistry for the benefits it provides. Jose Angel, you have a really short example of what teaching artistry might look like in our work. Yeah, so actually one of my, um, one of the fellows at the Academy for Impact Through Music, they are now in their second fellowship. And we have some nice examples from the first year of the fellowship. Um, and one of these colleagues, that used to work in, uh, that works in London, actually. Um, he did an amazing experiment based on how to um, encourage, how to foster and nurture the intrinsic motivation of his students while coming to a percussion class. So this was the problem he, he was tackling. He was, he was realizing that the students would come, you know, only with this, um, you know, to do their class and go home. So he really wanted the students to come prepared, to come motivated, to share with the, to have a better uh, class environment. So what he did, his hypothesis was that if he 
um, if he did some more extra activities, extra musical activities for, for them to get to know each other better and also for them to connect personally with what they were doing, they were going to come more motivated. And so he designed a series of experiments with games and with personal relevance activities so that the students could get to know each other better and also connect these activities through the music making they had to they had to do in the classes. And then he realized he did all the documentation, he did all the reflection process also in the Academy for Impact Through Music. They had sessions with a coach that was helping them and facilitating through the reflection process. And then he had his results. And the result was that students were indeed coming more motivated to the lessons. They came also with more ideas and they wanted to own the lesson just because of the personal relevance that now they were getting in the music sessions. And this came to another set of experiments on how maybe to get this more into musical results, for example. So this is an example of how by having this action research approach, he improved the class environment with his students. Uh, Jose, you're on a roll. Would you take on why action research? Yeah, I am. I'm very happy to do so. And actually, I have to say that um, the why of action research is really it's really why there is a lot of there is a lot of benefits uh, to do action research. Um, there is a graphic I prepare for you to share with you today. And the graphic is only about some reasons I find action research useful for, but not necessarily exclusive reasons. I'm sure that if you see action research from different lenses, you will find more benefits. But uh, I wanted to share with you that one of the benefits of action research is that it becomes a habit of mind. Um, you start seeking for constant improvement of the teaching practice. And actually, it becomes so embedded in your teaching practice that at some point, you cannot stop doing experiments and reviewing and trying to get new things and improve your own, um, your own personal development. Uh, so that's why action research becomes a habit of mind. Uh, it helps us document our practice. It provides clear documentation of the impact we do uh, in our lessons because we have, with action research, with the frame of action research, we have material, we have facts. We don't only, um, we don't only share our opinion of why things are working, but we can actually show powerful evidence. This powerful evidence also interests funders that can fund our work. It adds accountability and credibility to the work that we do. And one of the other reasons that I really like action research is because it tailors learning. It gives us the space to seek clear solutions to specific situations we are living. Maybe situations that are new to us that we haven't encountered before. And this tool gives us a path to look for solutions that might be new to us and really makes us think towards finding this tailored learning for our students. So that's why we use action research a lot. That's why we champion action research and we believe in action research. Beautiful, thank you, Jose. Uh, we're gonna look at the how of it now a very teaching artist thing, which is, okay, all sounds very good in the abstract and all those good advocacy points, but like, how does it work? So we're gonna take a shot at that. And Madeline is gonna post uh, the, the action research steps we use in AIM. So all of the fellows in uh, the AIM Firebird Fellowship uh, grapple with using this form to launch six-week cycles of experiments in their teaching year. And they have a little group that they check in with, their FAR lab, where they check in on a regular basis for how's their research going. Um, and there it is in the, in the chat box. There are three stages. The first, and I'll take on stage one and then pass it to Jose Angel, 
Uh, in stage one, you're looking for a focal challenge. Like what is important enough for me to shed this extra spotlight of attention and organization around to really advance in my teaching or if action research is focused on something different, like an organizational question that's important to work on in my organizational work. So you focus on what the challenge is. What do you want to focus on? And then you come up with a hunch. You already have that hunch. And we can call, give it a fancy name of a hypothesis or a thesis, but it's what you think you, if you work in this way, it's actually going to make a positive contribution. So you take that intuitive sense. The action research respects your expertise. We know we know a lot, maybe more than we know we know in the areas of our own teaching and learning. And this says where you have a, a, a feeling that if you head in this kind of a way, you're actually going to get a better result. And so that is the hypothesis so a challenge might look like my students are just compliant. I want them to be more intrinsically motivated, more invested. And then the hypothesis might then sound like, I bet I could spark students' motivation if I dot, dot, dot. And let me hand it to Jose Angel for what stage two looks like. And then we have stage two, which is after you have this focal challenge defined and your, your hypothesis, um, you design a series of experiments. And also you, you design, um, you, see a t you set a time frame for your experiments. I'm going to do this over this amount of weeks, this amount of sessions, and I expect maybe to have this result. The second part of stage two, which is also very important, and I think also we have to consider this in the very planning of our action research, is how we're going to collect documentation. That is documentation that is really, um, really clear towards what is happening. In the Academy of Impact through music, we use, for example, not only our teaching plans and our note taking and our reflection, but also we do a lot of recording of the sessions. But also, for example, you can plan questionnaires for your students. Um, you can plan interviews for your students. Um, you, can, you can do hypothesis trackers. You can do many, many things. You can design your own tools, but it's important that you collect this documentation that will help you, um, will help you come at the end towards a very, very clear result of what the action research was. And you can really, you can really track it down. Beautiful. The, so the question that would go with experiments is, so this is what I'm gonna do over the next six weeks or eight weeks, whatever it is. This is what it's gonna look like. And the question that goes with collecting documentation and data, these are the documents that will give evidence of what's happening in this experiment. And that may be the most challenging bit of it. Uh, that challenging idea of not making yourself crazy by gathering lots and lots of documents, but really having a feel for which documents can naturally be produced along the way that will be eloquent about what's happening in your students' learning. So that getting used to that documentation piece is really the part of the art of this work. And always on, we find that on a first try, it can be a little bit indefinite, but with a little practice, a few rounds of action research, we start to get really strategic and elegant in the choosing of the documents that will be eloquent about the learning sharp focused in the experiment. And then we get to stage three, where you analyze that documentation. You analyze the data. The data tells me this about the impact of the experiment. This is part of what gives action research extra credibility to teaching artists. 
because their claims are not just, oh, you could tell, or, oh, if you were in the room, or I know you actually apply some rigor to say the documents show this, take a look. So by being responsible to the documents and not just our impressions or our wishes, we actually add gravitas to uh, what we've accomplished. And then we come to a conclusion. The data tells me this part of the experiment worked and this part maybe didn't work so well. And the bounce, this amazing thing that invariably happens when you really feel satisfied with a conclusion, the curiosity for the next step, the extension, trying it again, uh, or a whole new direction to go in, springs out of a conclusion about the work. Uh, Jose, I'm gonna uh, look through the chat box for a minute, but can you take us through an actual experiment? Yes, my pleasure. So um, I'm going to share with all of you um, an experiment or like an action research design experiments and conclusions from one of our fellows from El Sistema Gris participating in the Academy for Impact Through Music um, in 2020. And I will ask Madeleine to share with everyone the action research map design which is an amazing document uh, that helps us articulate and design the action research. The action research. So as, as you see, you have these items to complete, which is action research title, the time period of your action research, the action research focus, uh, the hypothesis. If I do this, then what will happen? Then the experiments ideas, one, two, and three, looking for one, two, and three. We have to say that also we tried the action research to be, I mean, to not get really fancy, not really complicated. It can be something really, really straightforward so that it's also easier to, to tackle. And then what possible tools you will use to document your, your action research, your experiments, and then analyze. And then if we go to the second page, we see this document completed, the action research title was Developing Peer Interaction in Kipseli Orchestra. The Firebird was a conductor of a children orchestra. Uh, the action research time was going to be eight weeks, and the focus was the following. Uh, the orchestra can follow the conductor, but they lack peer interactions within their specific sections and within the whole orchestra. I would like to help them develop a better ensemble dynamic by improving their oral skills while playing. I want to prove if better social interaction can contribute to better musical results. And this is very, very important to, to keep in mind, how social interaction can make music performance better. This was the focus. The hypothesis is that if she was going to focus on the social and musical interactions, they will improve the teamwork agency, their holistic development, and it would lead towards better musical results. You see three experiments ideas, which is five minutes of playful activities and dynamics at the beginning of every rehearsal. It was more about getting to know each other. Then after sight reading a piece, facilitated activities to understand the role of each of them while playing in the orchestra. And then at the end of each session, a selection of students will play as a chamber music group without a conductor to have the space to put these skills into practice. Um, so you see basically looking for students to know each other's names, students to demonstrate also, and to know what is their role in the orchestra. And then um, the students would look at each other and respond, and respond uh, physically. We don't have here the possible tools highlighted, but the tools were going to be like notes, uh, video, audio recording, and lesson plans and observations. And then I wanted to show you, to, to share with you a second document, which is um, the lesson plan. Basically, the lesson plan, we have in the beginning a kind of summary of the action research, just to remind us of what's the action research about. 
and very briefly put in the dates, the class, the FARLAB, which is the project, and then all the, the action research design. Then you, if we go through these documents, we see that in page two, three, we have the lesson plan, which is basically the whole design of the lesson, uh, warm up, this activity, this exercise to achieve this. This is what we will need. This is a, what I will be doing as a, as a teacher. And this is what my students will be doing while we're doing this, this activity. And then at the end of the lesson plan, we see the observations after the lesson um, in regards to the action research focus, which is very important, not general observations, but really what's, you know, what's the, what's the relationship between this and the action research that I'm undertaking? And then what are my next steps with the results that I saw from this lesson? Um, so this is in the whole, let's say, stage of planning for action research. Now, I have to say also, I have to make a little parenthesis here, which is on the fact of action research being never a failure, because action research as a process will give you results that maybe are not what you expected, but the, the sole process of doing the action research and getting evidence that supports whether something works or not, it's already a success. So in this case, this, the... In this case, the hypothesis proved to be true. But if the hypothesis doesn't prove to be true, you are also succeeding because you are looking for solid answers. So I pass the baton now to Eric. <laughs> so thank you for talking us through what it looks like. And you'll notice the elements of habit of mind are the specificity of the focus. Your action research experiment might just be in a warm up exercise. Or it might be a different way of making transitions between sections of a lesson. So you're targeting, you are looking for documentation that is eloquent of impact, of change, and then you're showing respect for those documents. Those are the key ideas in building the habit of mind of action research. We have a, a few minutes for questions you may have before we put it in your laps to practice a little bit. So if you have a question, if it's burning, unmute and ask. If it's a little calmer, you can put it in the chat box and we'll take a shot at answering it in just these five minutes that we have for questions at this point. Anyone got questions? Uh, by the way, uh, I just got a note that uh, the F AIM fellows are just this week starting to put in their research experiment write-ups. Nine of them have already come in for different specific areas of their social impact through music work that they are going to undertake. So they're going through exactly what you're considering now. Uh, yet Candice, who is our experienced researcher, uh, she's drawing one distinction that in regular research, the researcher stands outside of the work and observes it and eventually reports what has been observed. In action research, the researcher is in the action and you can actually make changes as you go. It's formative research. Caitlin, you have a question. So a lot of this terminology is still uh, new to me, but um, the concepts aren't new. But uh, one of the biggest challenges I have in kind of designing things like this is how to avoid kind of a uh, positive bias. And again, some of the terminology is still new to me, but, uh, you know, in in so much of what we do uh, and assessing our own work, uh, you know, we're we need to sell ourselves and we need to be doing good work and so wanting the positive outcome uh, to not influence the actual outcome. And yeah, so I mean, it, it's really good to introduce that notion of the advocacy imperative that can inform this work. Like I need some kind of research data to, sh to validate the work that I'm doing. Uh, it does help certainly in AIM that we're an initiative and we're learning together. And so 
individually, we don't have to advocate for our work, but it, it's definitely something to watch for. Uh, it Over time, it gains strength for us if in fact we get a sharp eye to keep that advocacy impulse apart or late in the work and be really just p- curious about advancing our pedagogical effectiveness. We actually gain more credibility by being objective and using this as a learning tool than when we use it as an advocacy uh, tool. It takes some practice, especially since we're so scarcity embedded that we feel the need to advocate for the value of our work all the time. But the habit of mind is really to step into that learner observer space for the one part of our work we're gonna research. And it may just be a small part, but it gives, it adds muscle to the whole of the endeavor. And it does help to have colleagues in the in the mix with you. Barry. Thanks, Eric. Yes, I, I have a question that I think kind of piggybacks on what Caitlin just asked. And that is, is there um, addressing the idea that there might be a positivity bias from responders? That is, if I'm trying something and I'm getting responses from the students or from the teachers that I'm working with or my partners, um, how do we balance, you know, transparency in our goals and and encouraging objectivity from them, you know, and not just getting kind of rubber stamped because we put it out in a certain way saying I'm trying this. It it works, doesn't it? Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm not sure exactly how we... um how we expunge that impulse from the work because it's so collegial. I think it's fine to be transparent in the work. It's an experiment. And the sort of modeling, the genuine openness about what's appearing and what's learning and asking about it, actually making the learners uh, participants. We had a note about youth participatory action research in our chat box. Um, I think there's no way to be pure enough to completely extricate that. So I think my instinct and the way we think about it in AIM is we lean into that. We're interested to have our students interested with us and not trying to cheat the results toward a particular direction, but in fact, being curious learners about the connection between teaching and learning right alongside us. Um, I am not able to to read uh, the chat box, but if Jose, if you spot anything in there, you want to jump in and answer. Let's Can do I it. Can I ask something? Can yes. I ask something? Sorry. Yes. I don't know how to do the hand gesture. Okay. Um, good. So, at the at the moment, there is the world uh, football thing in Qatar, no? And if you think about. Uh, coaching a football team and looking how to get the best team and, and, and the practices to do that, how does that differ from action research? Because I, I don't really get the difference between coaching a football team and working on different problems within that team and making them better and trying to find solutions and what I've heard here. Well, let me take a shot at it. When you're trying to build the yes, best please. football, when you're trying to build the best football team, you are curious about the ways that you're teaching and coaching them, but your real focus is on the individuals and how the team is working. There's many of the same thoughts in the mix. If you were to bring action research to football coaching, you would be curious about ways you could bring into practice that would bring about better results. Action research is not about, you know, finding the way toward highest achievement, although that might be a part of it. We use it for more complex pedagogical ideas like um, how can I increase socio-emotional learning, a piece of it. So it's much more uh, focused on particular areas of experimentation that might add up over years to new ways of coaching or different uh, practice techniques to see what the long-term effect is. Uh, But it's generally focused on your own pedagogy or influence within your organization. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, it's in AIM, we're looking at musical ensembles. So excellence is a real reality in those settings, but we're thinking about mixing musical excellence with social development. And there's so much room for learning there. The narrowing down to specific improvement is where our energy needs to go. I need to move us on now if we're going to have a chance to practice. So apologies for those questions we didn't get to in the chat box yet, because I want to send you out on a 15-minute breakout. And the challenge here is for you to use the AIM format, which we will post again in the chat box, so you could copy it and bring it, to imagine an experiment you would undertake in your own teaching or organizational work. We're gonna put you in roughly in trios for you to have a couple of minutes of quiet at the beginning where you sketch out all those steps that might be an experiment and then talk with one another about the experiment you're thinking of and what might be a good documentation and how long a time period should it be. So you can think through the stages of the format. Uh, you don't have to do an experiment about working with young people and you certainly can. It doesn't even have to be about teaching. It could be, and Lord knows I've done enough of organizations that feel they're, having, they're being meetinged to death. Can you do an action research experiment about making meeting experiences more efficient, more effective? Pick something that matters to you and think through the steps. Uh, and okay, there, there we got it. And we'll post it one more time. You might wanna copy paste this so you can have it in your breakout. Take two minutes at least in quiet for you all individually in your breakout group to work on your own experiment and then see if you can help one another. And the final challenge, as we count down the time for you, see if you can describe your experiment in 20 seconds. When you come back, as far as you've gotten in your thinking, see if you can say, well, I'm going to do this and this would be the experiment and this would be the documentation and this is what I'd hope to learn. So at the end, give yourself a little culminating challenge to bring it together in a 20 second share. We won't get to hear all of them, but we may get to hear a few. Okay, Madeline, send them off for 15 minutes. Welcome back. Uh, we've all heard of speed dating. Little did you know there was such a thing as speed researching. Uh, we have just a few minutes to get a little feel for your experience of that practice. If you would, let's try just in five minutes, any observations about the process, put them in the chat. And we are also would love to hear if we have a couple of people who are bold enough to give us their 20-second research description. We'd love to hear a few brave people share what they got in mind, share what they're thinking might be interesting to research. What was it like to do that work? So it's fun to explore. It works. We'll find out. It's helpful. Okay. So it's it's landing in the teaching artist zone to in some degree. Uh, you should know while you were off doing your good work, we kept talking about youth participatory action research, which we're going to look up and find a way to build into our process. And we were talking about Barry and Caitlin's uh, invitation to be clear with young people that honesty matters. And it opens up a real channel for a different kind of relationship with them. Renee. Hey, thank you so much, Eric. I um, I want to thank you so much. Um, this is so ex exciting to me. I'm taking up 20 seconds just to say how excited I am, but um, I love when we're able to put terminology to things that we've already done. 
Um, so in a classroom where I had um, students who were transitioning middle school students from class to class, although it was like a, like next door, they would transition from next door, it would take them, you know, four minutes between each bell, but it would still be another 10 minutes before they were ready to learn. So the question was, you know, um, at that time, you know, how can I maximize or, you know, help the students find more instructional minutes during class? And the, you know, the hypothesis was, well, maybe if I introduce a way to self-calm and to arrive in the classroom that was like consistent every day, it would increase the, the learning time and their ability to really get into the classroom and be excited about the work. Um, and so, it, uh, you know, I institute like a five minute quiet time. I had like music, the lights out, and then I did it for like nine weeks. Um, and during that time, I had, you know, three week increments where I could check in like on times. It took 10 minutes to learn on the first week. Week three was at, you know, um, I think like something like six minutes. And then by week nine, we were at two minutes. Um, and then I was able to also do an informal, you know, kind of collection in terms of of, uh, you know, just uh, uh, doing reflective practices and formal reflective practices for the students to talk about it um, and how it felt to like be calm as they learned. And then also I did a survey at the end of those nine weeks um, because it was something I wanted to institute within the whole school. So I needed to have documentation. Um, so, you know, but overall we were able to extend to 40 minutes per week of more instructional time. Renee, that's a beautiful articulation of a whole journey through action research, uh, the experimental focus, how it grew, and the kind of results that you got. It's an inspiring example. It actually reminds me of Big Noise, the group of Sistema Scotland faced the same challenge, and their action research ended up having kids sing in the transition between classes. So it kept the focus, it kept the musical work going forward. And when you would go visit that place, there's kids singing through the hallways at every transition. And Nicoletta, can I ask you for the boldness of 20 seconds? Because we're going to have to move on. Yes, I will. This is uh, at this stage, my action region research is a research plan which title is My Body is a Classroom. And uh, the focus or research question is how to improve imagination in learning process inside secondary school classroom. So the experiments would be, will consist, will consist in an implementation of all the phases of a collective devising process of an original theater piece uh, that will apply performance as a, embodied learning strategy in order to improve imagination. And uh, the, this piece will be inspired in uh, learning prompts that the pupils and the students have learned, uh, have proposed based on their internal uh, in interest and motivation. Beautiful. Yeah, Beautiful. thank you. So I hear you starting to narrow it down. A reminder to everyone, an action research experiment is easier to manage and it's easier to get documentation that is elegant if it's a narrow focus. Over time, you can build it out in the powerful way Renee was telling us and that Nicoletta is thinking. But as you get started in using the form, think more narrow until you start having the habit of mind. Uh, I'm going to turn our attention and give it back to Jose Angel to introduce the working group that is going to spring from whoever is interested on this call uh, to do a little more work on this. Uh, he's going to lead this group. I'll be in support of the group, but we want to create a useful tool for teaching artists around the world. Jose, what is that working group going to be like? Yeah, so I have uh, I have prepared a document to share with everyone so that we can go and be really you know clear about about what the working group is about, what's the goal of this, what will what it will entail, like what what's the what would be required, what's the time frame. But basically, we will form a working group for the production of a handbook. This was the main idea of a handbook on action research for arts education that will be published and distributed for the profit of the wider field. But actually the word handbook, I want to, I want to highlight that work because actually the handbook, it's a bit for me, 
it doesn't mean anything in the sense that it could be it could be a different framework it could be a storybook it could be a comic book it could be a set of videos i don't know this is what the working group will define together i've put together also some ideas for the content of this tool that we are going to produce all together but these ideas of course are not uh, carved from stone so actually we will we will discuss them and we will put them in a way that makes sense for teaching artists um, the work dynamic of this working group will be having monthly meetings with uh, some work in between. So after this session, I will send some Doodle polls, some uh, and a Google document, so that we can start gathering ideas. Then we will then we will meet in January to define the content, our structure, and the work dynamic that we will take as a group. Then we will work in our personal things. Then in February, we will present our results. We will decide on the format of this tool, how we want to present it. And we will also divide further tasks so that we kind of, um, we kind of do the housekeeping for this document so that it's ready um, to distribute. And then at the end, in the March meeting, I don't know if I am too uh, ambitious, but I would like to keep it this way. Uh, we will have the tool ready so that we can review it and we can, you know, also brainstorm on, on channels or of distribution and, and, and then it will be ready to distribute to all the teaching artists worldwide. Beautiful. So just to reiterate, if you sign up for it, and in a moment, Madeline is going to tell you how to do that. Um, it's going to, we expect it'll run over three months. There'll be maybe just three meetings. There might be some working groups, but it's not a heavy lift, but it's targeted. And we need teaching artist voice to make sure it really resonates. And it is in a form that is useful. Uh, we're going to start for those who would like to stay on this Zoom call for an extra 15 minutes, we're going to get started right away. Jose Angel is going to start to see who's interested, start to share some ideas. Uh, Madeline, how do people like let us know they want to be a part of the working group? So I have just now shared a link in the chat, a um, working group registration form. And if you could go in there, indicate your interest, fill out your details about time zone, that'll help us hone in on meeting times and things like that. Um, but that's the first place to register your interest. Um, and then we will be back in touch. Questions before we say goodbye to those who are done with the session and don't want to be in the working group. Uh, any parting questions? Maybe not. All right. So let's say a fond and grateful goodbye to those who came for the session. And we hope you take away something useful. And those who have a little interest in finding out, sounding out, getting a feel for the working group, stick around. <laughs>